In this video, we'll do a complete design walkthrough of this USB-based headphone amplifier featuring a Texas Instruments PCM2900 USB codec, as well as a completely custom power stage and completely custom analog front end. We'll go through the high-level system design, including block diagram, schematic, PCB layout and routing, and I'll show you a quick plug-and-play test at the end. Every year, I pretty much give this headphone amplifier a tiny update, depending on my needs, maybe I found some better circuit design te techniques and so on. You can see this evolution if you go through my videos, for example, video number 24 shows the first version of this headphone amplifier. That was just exploring the idea of paralleling many op amps, in this case, any 5532 audio op amps to increase the drive capability, reduce noise, and so on. I must admit, of course, that I nicked this idea from Douglas Self, who is a very prominent figure in the audio electronics industry, and I can really, really highly recommend the Small Signal Audio Design book, and I pretty much have all of his books. In this book, he also mentioned that he designed an amplifier, the 5532 op amplifier, which is a power amp, not a headphone amplifier power amp, using many, many paralleled any 5532 op amps. And I thought it'd be interesting to, to move that over to a headphone amplifier design where we need far less power than, for example, driving hi-fi speakers. To get the full detail on the circuitry, for example, the Baxendale volume control I'm using in this design, which is a great volume control, make sure to check out video number 24. Then a year later in 2022, I did an updated version of this design, still fully analog. So we have RCA inputs or quarter inch jack input, DC power and so on, and then a headphone amplifier output. The next update, which is this video, I moved to a completely USB input design. At the end of the day, my audio source is typically a computer or a laptop, and I found it a bit annoying to just go through my computer's sound card, then find some converter cable to go to RCA or to a quarter inch stereo jack. Then I decided, okay, let me just make a USB headphone amplifier. And this is exactly what this video is then about, the evolution of this design, where the analog section is still very much based on the original two designs, but I've updated it so it's just a USB-C connection on the one end, which is power and data, and then audio on the other end. And let me show you that in this video. Because I've had quite a lot of requests from the first two videos of people interested in this design and also would like to purchase one to play around with, and because it is indeed a quite a good sounding amplifier in my opinion, although I am biased, I am putting this up for sale, this USB version. Now this USB version is without the enclosure, without any faceplates, but if you would like an enclosure and some faceplates, please do contact me and I can get those to you as well. But I'm offering the baseboard fully assembled with through hole and SMD components on my website and I'll leave a link to this in the description below should you be interested. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I designed this NEXT USB headphone amplifier completely using Altium Designer and we'll do a full design walkthrough in this video and I'll guide you through the schematic and the PCB layout in Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, check out all the cool new Altium 365 features such as version control, MCAD, co-design and so on. Make sure to check out the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's Lab and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial as well as 25% off your first license purchase. Thanks a lot also to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. I had these NEXT USB headphone amplifiers completely manufactured and assembled by them and they've turned out great. So thank you very much to them. And I'll leave a link to them in the description below as well. Before we dive deeper into the schematic and the PCB layout and routing, let me give you a high level overview in the form of a block diagram of this NEXT USB headphone amplifier. I've gone through quite a few iterations also on this USB headphone amplifier. I'm on revision C now because I've made some tweaks and adjustments to get it just right. So in its current version in revision C, this is the block diagram. On the left hand side, we have a USB type C connector, and this is for both power and for data. Power, I feed through a filter as well as a fuse, and this gives me normally 5 volts. USB in the spec is between 4.5 and 5.5 volts max, but 5 volts nominal. I need several different power supplies in my system, both for the digital side and for the analog side as well. And let me show you how I did that. The centerpiece of this design is this PCM2900 USB codec. I could have gone the route, of course, having a microcontroller programming the USB drivers and then feeding the USB data from my host machine through to a DAC and then through the audio output. But that's quite a lot of work for such a fairly simple system and luckily there are pre-made ICs, for example, this PCM2900 by Texas Instruments that combine everything into one IC. As you can see, it's also not recommended for new designs. There are newer versions, but I was able to secure quite a number of these PCM2900s. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go with this design for now, as it's also very easy to interface with. This is from the Burr Baron division at Texas Instruments. So really cool audio products they usually make. Another reason for choosing this. 
I chose this mainly because of the simplicity and because I didn't want to bother with writing my own drivers and connecting up this fairly convoluted system. And cost wise, this was also pretty appropriate, this IC. I chose PCM2900, which is out this digital interface SPDIF, but it has all of the USB signaling on board. So it's full speed and USB 1.1 compliant, which of course seems a bit old by these days. But then again, it's an audio based headphone amplifier. We don't need particularly fancy specs. In the audio world, this might be a bit frowned on. It's only 16 bit, but for me, I love music, but I'm, I wouldn't consider myself an audiophile and this is perfectly fine for myself. And a DAC output at a sampling rate at 48 kilohertz. So 16 bit 48 kilohertz is completely fine for me. That's CD quality. It also does have stereo ADCs, so in case you want to maybe have an, an instrument or line or microphone input, you could also do that. But for us, for this project, I only wanted a stereo output, so I need the DAC part. You can see all of the various performances here, so signal to noise ratio, total harmonic distortion plus noise, and so on. The nice thing is this runs the digital section off the USB V bus voltage, which is normally 5 volts. I haven't indicated this 5 volt connection on the block diagram, but I have added an LDO, which feeds the analog section of this PCM2900 codec for improved analog and noise performance. The PCM2900, this USB codec, also requires a 12 MHz crystal to run. So essentially we just have the data connection, power connection, and we have audio out, rather simply. And we'll go into more detail when we look at the schematic. I also have other sections in my power supply, for instance this boost converter. I'm using any 5532 op amps, and they require larger voltage rails than ground and 5 volts, so I need to step up this voltage. And the way I do that is via boost converter, where I take 5 volts in, nominally from a USB connection, and step that up to 16 volts. Then, because it's a switching regulator, I'll add a simple filter, as well as an LDO, and in this case it's a low noise LDO, and drop that back down to 15 volts. And that's then what my whole audio section is running off of. So I'm getting quite a large headroom thanks to this 15 volt supply. And I've done these extra steps, filter and LDO, following the boost converter to reduce my power supply noise. I then also perform some more filtering, which you'll see in the schematic. Because this is a single ended supply, so 0 and 15 volts for the audio section, I need to bias my op amps appropriately at half rail. And we'll see that more when we go into the schematic. The audio section itself has as its output a stereo headphone jack, and this is a quarter inch jack to feed most studio headphones. But of course you could via converter also connect an eighth inch jack, for example for using earbuds. But this design was specifically made for studio grade headphones such as Sennheiser HD 650s, 600s, Biodynamics and so on. To control the volume, and this is the only control on this device, I've added a dual gang potentiometer, dual gang meaning it has essentially two channels, and this is a linear potentiometer, not a logarithmic one, because of this Baxandau volume control, and I recommend watching my first video for an explanation on the Baxandau volume control in detail. In any case, the audio part is fairly simple. As soon as we're coming out of this PCM2900, the left and the right channels, they are identical. We have a buffer as well as a DAC filter, so a reconstruction filter, so to speak, which has a cutoff, which we'll see in the schematic. Then we have a Baxandal volume control, which is a really great natural feeling volume control, which I've had in my previous versions as well. And then power amps. And power amps, power taken lightly because we're only driving headphones. But this is where we're using this paralleling technique of these NE5532 op amps. And we'll see this in the schematic in just a second. So as you can see, quite a simple, straightforward system. Let's jump over to the schematic in Altium Designer. Here we are on the schematic page of the NEXT USB headphone amplifier. You can see it's quite a large page. We'll zoom in and look at each section individually. As we've gone through the block diagram already, a lot of these sections should seem very familiar. Let's start at the top at the power and data entry at this USB connector. I'm using a USB Type-C connector. So we have power, VBUS, going straight through a fuse, and then through this Pi filter, which consists of C6, FP2, and C7. And so this is a bi-directional filter, and this is the first thing I'd always do, and I'd recommend you do when you're powering something from USB. C6 will also act as a very simple form of ESD protection, and this will at least take out some of the higher frequency noise. And then we have the USB differential pair, and of course this is USB-C, so therefore we'll always have two sets of these pins, so VBUS, data, and so on. Now, since this is USB 1.1 and full speed, we can be pretty lax when it comes to USB routing. Therefore, I'm just tying the relevant pins together 
and then routing them out. You can do some pretty crazy stuff and it'll still work. I've added some ESD protection in the form of these bi-directional TVS diodes, as well as these 30 picofarad capacitors, which is still within margin for the USB 1.1 spec of how much capacitance we can have on the line. Of course, you have to take into account line capacitances, trace capacitance, and so on. But I've put these here in case I want to put this, for example, through EMC testing. It's always good to have the pads available at these, at these lines. Then we have the CC or communication channel pins. And these are, very simply speaking, to negotiate power from the host. In our case, we don't have any particular controller IC. So therefore, I'm just pulling each of these lines down individually with a 5K1 resistor. And this will give us up to 1.5 amps. Now, of course, this 1.5 amps is overkill, but this is the standard negotiation. In fact, this design at 5 volts draws only about 0.2 amps, so 200 milliamps max. Then we have the shield connection. I'd either recommend leaving the shield floating or simply placing a high voltage rated small capacitor between the USB shield and your system ground. In case I want to have a play around, I would always advise to place do not place parts depending on your particular needs. Then moving on, remember our USB-C connector does not only provide data connection, but it also provides power. So after we have our Pi filter with these two capacitors and a ferrite bead, we move on into the power supplies. Remembering back to our block diagram, a 5 volts feeds the boost converter, then a filter and an LDO for the analog section, as well as straight away an LDO, which feeds the PCM2900 codec. And this is exactly what we see here. We have the boost converter, which I chose this TPS61040, which is a pretty standard boost converter, up to 400 milliamps output, which is of course far overkill for our design, but it's within margin. All of these values I simply got from the data sheet of the part. So what size inductor I need, input and output capacitors, what diode ratings and so on, I all just got from the data sheet and a lot of this design is based on these parts data sheets. The output voltage is about 16 volts and here accurately it's about 15.8 volts based on R4 and R5. Following that, I have, following that, I'm using FB3, which is another ferrite bead, in combination with C10, which is the output capacitor of U1, our boost converter, and the input capacitor of the LDO regulator, I'm using these three to form another Pi filter. Boost converters can be quite noisy, especially if you want to use them for feeding analog supply rails. So what I did, I used another filter, also utilizing components I already have on the board, but then I also follow that with an LDO regulator. This particular audio regulator is a fairly low noise model and a fairly simple regulator to set up. The data sheet, I believe, states a minimum of one microfarad ceramic capacitors for stability on input and output. And I set my output voltage with R6 and R7, and that's about 15 volts, 14.7 to be precise. Now, following that, you could either hook that up directly to your power supply. But what I found in the previous revision, and this is why I added this in, is that I do need to follow that by another low pass filter. Keep in mind, we have this Pi filter, then we have an LDO regulator, but then I had to add another low pass filter to improve the noise of this design. And the way I did that was very, very simply using an RC low pass filter. Because the analog section actually doesn't draw very much current, 40 to 60 milliamps, I can use a 20 ohm resistor rated about a quarter watt just to, so we have some margin feeding into C13 and C14, which are large electrolytic capacitors. After the power section, let's look at the USB codec. And this is actually quite simple to set up given that all the information is in the datasheet. Please excuse this symbol here. Due to time constraints and because it was available in the manufacturer part search in Altium, I just took their symbol. So this is some sort of automatically generated symbol. The pinout might be correct, but this is definitely not how I would draw my own schematic symbols. You can see the arrangement is pretty rough, especially these crystal pins such as XTI and XT0 means I have to have this floating sets of symbols over here, which I don't really like. In any case, there's quite a few sections to this PCM2900. We have a digital section, various supply rails, we have the USB differential pair, suspend signals, grounds, and so on. All of this is nicely explained in the data sheet. For example, you can take a look at the functional block diagram. You can see what the internal sections are to this device. Very simply speaking, we have a USB connection. We have HID signals or HID zero to two. We can connect, for example, push buttons too. So we can automatically send requests to the host, for example, to play or pause or to volume up and volume down. I didn't use this in this design because we're just using a simple Baxendale volume control together with a potentiometer. We also have input left and right signals, which are for the ADC, and I'm not using ADC, I'm not connecting a microphone or any line level signal as an input, so I've just tied these via resistors to ground. On the other side, we have our output left and right, and these are signals we are actually using to feed our analog output stage, our analog front end. 
resistors such as the 22 ohm resistors or these pull-up resistors, all of that information I got directly from the datasheet. And they have typical application circuits. It's slightly messy here the way they've drawn it, but it's enough information to extract that and then to put that into your own schematic. As you can see, we also have a dedicated analog regulator here, voltage range 3.6 to 3.85 volts. And that's what, of course, we've included in the design, as well as all of this surrounding circuitry. I've just popped into Altium Designer. What you might have already noticed is these ground connections on the bottom right. We seemingly have an analog ground and a digital ground. And with me, they're going to the same symbol. And this is because in most mixed signal designs, in 99% of cases, you shouldn't split your grounds. So you shouldn't do any sort of interesting ground splits or put ferret beads between them. A single solid continuous ground section. And the key is to do physical separation and to avoid field spread. And we'll see that when we come to the PCB design. We also, of course, need a 12 megahertz crystal oscillator with this external circuitry, again, detailed in the data sheet. And that's pretty much all there is to this PCM2900. So very, very simple to set up. At this point, again, I'd strongly suggest watching video number 24, which we saw at the beginning of this video, which goes into far greater detail of the actual analog circuitry design behind this. As not much has changed with regard to the analog section, I'm going to gloss over some details in this video. So if you want, of course, please do check out video number 24 on my channel. In any case, back in the schematic, we had the PCM2900 with the DAC outputs, so out left and out right, and then these feed two identical analog sections. So we have this section at the top here, which is identical to the section at the bottom. So I'll just go through the top, and keep in mind this is mirrored for left and right channels. In the block diagram, we saw that the first thing we have is a buffer, as well as a reconstruction filter, so to speak, a low pass filter, then a backstand or volume control, and then a power amplifier, and then feeding a stereo headphone jack. Let's see how that translates into the schematic. There's a few comments I'd like to make before we delve a bit deeper. First of all is that of low resistance design or low impedance design. And this is also a principle taught by Douglas Self in his books, which I mentioned at the start of this video, is that for audio, especially within the signal path, so anything in series, should have as low impedance as is feasible. Resistors generate Johnson noise, which is directly related to the resistance. So the higher resistance, the higher the noise these resist resistors will produce. Therefore, we want to minimize their value within reason. Within reason means these op amps will see these resistances and need to be able to drive them. For example, at any 5532, you can pretty much say safely drive 600 ohm loads. Therefore, you should drive something in reason as to minimize distortion as well. There's always this kind of trade-off. Secondly, we want our resistors to be thin film resistors. Thick film resistors can introduce and will introduce distortion into your signal as well. When it comes to capacitors, when we're choosing electrolytic capacitors, these are perfectly fine in the signal path as long as they are large enough. So you don't want to choose them right on limit in small values. You want to choose fairly sizable electrolytic capacitors. If you do go with ceramic capacitors, especially in the signal path, you should choose them of type COG, so a particular dielectric, as otherwise most ceramic capacitors will have piezoelectric effects and will introduce distortion. Bypass capacitors, for example, between the 15 volt and ground rails can be pretty much any type. So X7R, X5R and so on. Of course, choose them suitably for your application as well as the voltage ratings as well. When it comes to voltage ratings for capacitors, I always try to go with double of what the expected DC voltage is. So for example, this C2700 nanofarads, I would choose at least a 30 volt rating. So 35 volt rating is the closest one or 50 volt rating in this case. In any case, let's get started actually looking at the audio circuit in detail. We come out of this PCM2900 DAC, couple it, AC couple it with C26, again, an electrolytic capacitor chosen fairly large, feeding in to the buffer. We do have this resistor here, and this is a biasing resistor, R21 at 22 kilo ohms, together with C26 will form the low cutoff frequency. So 1 over 2 pi, 22 kilo ohms times 100 microfarads will give us the low frequency cutoff. And then we're pulling that to plus VBL. The question is, where does VBL come from and what does it do? VBL comes from this bias generator. We need to bias these op amps not to ground, but to a voltage halfway between the supply rails because we're using a single supply design. This means for 15 volts, the op amp will nominally sit at 7.5 volts right in the center. So we get maximum output swing, both positive and negative. And this is a very common technique for biasing. 
For this, I used two equal value resistors, so we get a half division, a large filtering capacitor, and that then supplies VREF, and then I feed that into two unity gain buffers, one bias for the left channel and one bias for the right channel, so I can minimize crosstalk, for example. You might think C48 in combination with these resistances is rather overkill. This reference voltage here will have a very slow ramp up, and this was a deliberate and it was a compromised choice. Because this is a single supply amplifier, I need coupling cap capacitors at the output so my headphones don't see any DC. However, as soon as you plug in this amplifier and you have this supply rail or this bias run up very quickly, you'll get a loud pop of the output at your headphone amplifiers as the capacitors charge. One way of mitigating this is maybe putting relays in, which would only close the circuit once the capacitor is charged and so on, but that adds cost complexity. And I went the really simple route and that is I slowed down the rise time of my reference and supply voltages. And that's why C48 is rather large. C48 also should be there because any supply rail noise, yes, it'll get halved due to the VREF, but this bias noise will directly couple onto my audio path and that's why you should low pass filter it. So moving back, VBL is our halfway supply voltage so we can bias these op amps. In any case, we have an input buffer. The input impedance is defined by R21 predominantly at AC, so we have a 22K input impedance, which the DAC is very happy to see. Then we have a very, very simple first order low pass filter. R22 in combination with C28 in parallel form a first order low pass filter. And then you can see up here, I've done the calculation, the minus three dB cutoff frequency is 55 kilohertz. But I chose that because at 20 kilohertz, I only want a drop of about 0.5 dB in gain. I want this a pretty flat band before then. And then we drive this Baxendale volume control. Again, I can't stress this enough. Please do check out video number 24 and I go into detail of how this Baxendale volume control works and why it's, it's so useful. In any case, the control for this Baxendale volume control is a dual gang potentiometer. So one side is for the left channel and the other side is the right channel, which is at the bottom of the schematic. And this circuitry, these two op amps and the potentiometer form the Baxendale volume control. Essentially, it's just a buffer and an amplifier configured in a negative feedback configuration. The maximum volume we can achieve is determined by the ratio of R25 to R24, this inverting amplifier. 5.1 over 1.5 is about 3.4. The voltage gain in decibels maximum is about 11 decibels. That is plenty for a headphone amplifier and you could probably even go lower. But R25 and R24 might be values you'd want to play around with if you want a slightly lower gain headphone amplifier or a slightly higher gain one. So very simple to change and doesn't depend on this potentiometer. Also, the actual value of this potentiometer doesn't really matter. At least it doesn't matter for the gain. However, it does matter for the input impedance, or rather the impedance seen by the preceding buffer. If we choose this volume control resistance too small, this buffer, U5B in this case, will have a harder time driving it. Approximately the minimum input impedance from a Baxendale control is 0.23 times the resistance of the potentiometer. So the minimum input impedance U5B sees is 2.3 kilo ohms. So well within line of what an NE5532 can drive. Now we've looked at the Baxendale volume control. We finally move on to the power amp and then the stereo headphone jack. I've calmed down a bit over the years. I'm not paralleling 12 of these op amps anymore. I simply went with four parallel op amps configured as voltage followers, and I'm summing the outputs with one ohm series resistors. I'm paralleling op amps to decrease the noise floor of the output stage, as well as to increase the current drive capability. The data sheet for the NE5532 states for 600 ohm load, we can drive about 15 volts at an output, so we quadruple our drive strength, so to speak, when we parallel them. The output impedance of this amplifier is therefore predominantly determined by the parallel combination of these four output resistors, so 0 0.25 ohms. Because this output and anything in this audio path so far has been sitting at half the supply voltage, so in this case about 7.5 volts, if we fed this directly to the headphone amplifier, that wouldn't be entirely ideal. Therefore, we have to AC couple it, and we have to use a fairly large capacitor, again to minimize distortion because of the electrolytic type, also because we don't want a large low frequency or bass roll off. C35 in combination with the impedance or resistance of the headphone amplifier will form a high pass filter. So for example, if you're using 32 ohm earbuds, we have one over two pi, a thousand microfarads times 32, and that should still be in order and not give us a too terrible cutoff frequency. R32 is a simple bleed resistor, and I've chosen a fairly low value here. Of course, we go with 22 kilo ohms. But R32, if no headphones are connected, means C35 can charge and discharge quicker through this resistor. Then anytime I feed an output, I do like to place a series element so that could be a resistor. 
In this case, I went with a ferrite bead, which acts resistively at higher frequencies. ESD protection and a small amount of capacitance, again, for EMI reasons and protection reasons. And then I simply feed my headphone jack output. And this whole circuitry is then simply copied and repeated for the left and right channels. And that's all there is pretty much to this headphone amplifier. Just some quick info for the analog front end. I ran some simulations. And these are the results from my SPI simulations. Also keep in mind that this is cascaded, so to speak, with the PCM2900 specs, and those together will then give an overall performance. For the analog front end on its own, so essentially the buffers, the back sandal volume controls, the output drivers, with output impedance is 0.25 ohms. The bandwidth, which I've set at minus 0.5 dB, not minus 3 dB, is about 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Again, so maximum volume control gain is 3.4, down to zero, of course, or in dB minus infinity to 10.6 decibels. The equivalent input noise from simulation was minus 120 dBU, that's taking gain out of the equation, and the total harmonic distortion at the output at 1 kilohertz for 150 ohm load is rather small at 0.001%. But again, keep in mind, this is not cascaded. This is not in combination with the PCM2900. The power consumption at idle, running off a 5 volt USB power supply is 1 watt, so about 200 milliamps. Now let's take a look at the PCB and how I've laid out and routed this fairly simple design. As you might have spotted on the schematic, on the bottom left here, I designed the board shape for a particular enclosure. In particular, I designed it for this Hammond enclosure. I'm quite a fan of Hammond enclosures because they provide CAD models, drawings, and also the, what sizes you need for your PCBs. And then simply, you can create custom front and rear panels. In any case, that was the driving factor for this size of board. Of course, I could have packed it smaller, maybe chosen a different enclosure, but this is actually still a fairly small enclosure at about 80 by 100 millimeters. Let's first of all talk about sectioning, and this is the most important thing when it comes to mixed signal hardware design. We strictly want to separate our digital and analog sections and keep as much space as we can between them. And this you can see quite clearly on this PCB design. The top where we have our USB, which is completely digital, we have this small section here, which is only reserved for digital and power, maybe. Digital right here at the top, so the USB differential pair and power on the right hand side. I'll try to also place power further away so we don't get any direct interference, but nothing in the analog section. The question is where do you draw the line between analog and digital sections? And that oftentimes is determined by mechanical constraints, maybe connector placements and so on. But in this case, it is determined also, of course, by the pinout of the PCM2900, which is this IC in the middle. If we go to 2D view, and if I just shelve this polygon to make it easier to see and zoom in, we can see there is some sort of separation. At the top, we have our digital signals, for example, the USB differential pair, USB power, suspend signals, controls, and so on. Whereas at the bottom, we have our analog inputs, analog outputs, and so on. And this for us is quite good as PCB designers because this defines our split. So somewhere around pin 10 and nine, I want to draw an imaginary line and say, okay, anything above that is digital, anything below is analog. And this is exactly what I've done. So that line, you can see I've done these stitching vias. And I, this is also for me visually to see, okay, anything below that is analog, anything above that is digital. And this is very important that you do that. Once you've done that, once you've separated your line, it's very important that you keep space. And this is the number one rule when it comes to mixed signal design, is space everything analog far away as you can from the digital sections. And that's exactly what I've done here. You can see this line of op amps starts far away from the actual digital lines, for example. And I'd recommend choosing ICs that allow you to accommodate easier mixed signal routing as well. In any case, now we've discovered digital and analog, I've also divided up the analog section as well. On the left hand side, we have this preamplifier, so to speak, so the buffer, the volume control, and on the right hand side, we have our power amplifier, so to speak, as well as this optional LED, which on my boards I didn't assemble because I quite like it without. This board is a four layer board, and of course this, is, this could have been routed into a two layer board, but given that four layer boards are so inexpensive these days, and you get quite a lot of benefits, ease of routing and so on, I just decided to go with a four layer board, just because I felt like it. My usual four layer stack up is that I have layer one is signal, my first inner layer is completely dedicated to a ground plane, same thing goes for inner layer two, which is layer three in this four layer board, another completely solid ground plane, and layer four is signal again. You can see I also have ground pores on layers one and layer four, because otherwise there would be a lot of empty space not filled with copper, which is rather wasteful, and, and this will also improve board warp and copper balancing. Let me hide those pores for now, so we can see what's going on with the routing. 
There's not too much to the digital section other than the usual of placing decoupling capacitors close to where they need to be, close to the relevant pins. I've routed power, as you can see by these thicker traces, and for a board of this kind of speed or rather low speed, this is absolutely fine. For analog, I would pretty much always route power anyway, and you can do that up to gigahertz speeds. So analog, always route power, I'd suggest. And digital, power planes only become necessary for very high speed designs. What you have to pay attention to is this crystal, making sure that this isn't close, for example, to the USB traces or any higher speed switching traces. And so it's in its own little section over here. The power supplies for the analog section are still somewhat in this digital side, but I've moved them over because I have the space and spaced them out a bit. First of all, we have our boost converter, and the same thing for all switching converters is keep your loops tight and small. So I have my boost converter IC, I have my diode, my inductor, bypass capacitors, all in a tight loop as small as I can, keeping in mind that we want to, we want to have this assembled, so we still have to keep some decent spacing. From that, we feed through this Pi filter into the audio regulator, which gives us our 15 volts. Then I route this trace far away from all the digital section through my series resistor and this series resistor essentially bridges between my digital into my analog side. So this is always how I like to cross that gap, so to speak, is always through maybe some series element or as far away as I can from the digital section. And this feeds these two large bypass capacitors and this forms the main supply rail for my analog circuitry on the bottom side of this board. You can also see I've placed all this stitching vias, all these perimeters around the board. And if I restore my top and bottom copper pores, you can see I've also exposed these strips of ground. This is one for shielding. This really helps against ed fired emissions. It also helps between these sections. And the stitching is chosen with a 20th of the wavelength that's within this design. I also like to have these on boards for aesthetics, of course. I think it looks rather cool. It also helps with the sectioning. But also, these grounding points are nice for testing as well. So I can attach my ground plopes from my oscilloscope, for example, to these points very simply all around this board. As I said before, this is a fairly simple board. There's not much to the routing other than making sure you have spacing and separation. So that's what I try to do. I try to space out left and right channels, making sure I use fairly thin traces for my analog circuitry, for my signals, and thicker traces for my power delivery. These little gold dots you see are test points, and I try to provide pretty much 100% test point coverage in case you want to test these boards in production or for the first few prototypes, of course. Other than that, the markers in the top right and the bottom left, top left, as well as these holes are tooling holes and for digital markers for automatic SMT assembly. As usual, adding version numbers, websites, and a description of what maybe these sections or connectors are. All in all, as I said before, you could route this on a two layer board, four layer board makes the routing cleaner, makes your ground cleaner. And as you saw, it's a completely solid ground plane. No cuts in the ground plane. The main thing being keeping separation between analog and digital, of course. I have one of these NEXT USB boards in my hand. I also have a USB-C cable and I've got my device manager open. And these are the devices it sees at the moment. The nice thing about this PCM2900 is that, at least on Windows, it's plug and play. So if I plug the cable in, you can see a new device has appeared, this USB audio codec. If you look at the driver, it's Microsoft has automatically assigned one to it. All that I also have connected to my computer is one of these USB-based oscilloscopes and function generators by Digilent, the Analog Discovery Pro, and we'll use that just to do some basic measurements, and I'll show you that this, of course, works pretty much out of the box. Of course, it's very hard to describe the audio quality. This actually has replaced pretty much all of my other audio interfaces, so from Focusrite or the one I have here is by M Audio. This is pretty much the main headphone amplifier I use these days because I quite like the quality. Of course, this design has evolved a bit as well. So for example, I've got my waveform software open, which is the accompanying software for my USB based oscilloscope. I'll just play one of my videos for audio tests so there's no copyright problems. So I have my speakers selected as USB audio codec. I'm just probing the output. This is just one of my videos playing. And of course I can decrease the volume. I can increase the volume with my volume control. So as you can see, it's pretty much a plug and play device, which is really cool as well. No additional drivers needed. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it gave you some inspiration to maybe try and make your own USB based headphone amplifier. If you would like to purchase one instead, please make sure to visit the link in the description below and you can buy one directly through my store. If you liked the video, please do leave a like, a comment if you have any questions and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any latest video release. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.